Um, so it's good to see everybody back. My name is Michael Ibrahim, and we're so happy to have Aaron and Anita here today to talk about uh, best practices in creating a positive work from home experience, which is something that we're all facing. Um, a lot of folks say, why do we need to cover this now? We've all been working from home, but it doesn't mean we're doing it the healthy way or a positive way. And it doesn't mean that it's gonna end it anytime soon, particularly with hybrid work uh, environments or sometimes in permanent uh, work from home. So we're excited to be able to offer this and have your expertise on how to do this. Um, just a quick ground rule. Uh, we've got some closed captioning down at the bottom of the screen. Um, we provide live transcriptions for all Mass Cultural Council webinars and meetings. Uh, if you need any additional and further accommodations, just let us know when you register. If you find this is distracting, you can also minimize the captions in the Zoom menu at the, at the bottom. Um, this session is being recorded and will be available afterwards on our YouTube channel. We have hundreds of videos on our YouTube channel. In particular, this series, uh, we have over 20 videos already from everything that we've done. So this will be joining that probably sometime tomorrow. I'll email you when that is ready. Uh, my colleague on the Cultural Investment Portfolio team, Cheyenne cohn Pastel, is here um, and will help us in the chat. Thank you, Cheyenne, providing some resources as we go along. Um, the session is marked to run until four o'clock. And with that, Aaron and Nita, love to hear from you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, give me a moment, I'm gonna share my screen. And there we go. Um, so hello everybody, um, you are in creating a positive work from home experience. So um, hopefully that's the, the workshop you need to be in. And now you have this title card. So you know that's where you are. Um, we are uh, Anita Morrison Matra and Aaron Johnson, um, two members of EA Strategic Partners. Um, and um, I'll introduce myself quickly and give Anita a chance to tell her, tell you all a little bit about herself before we move on. Um, so um, again, as, as I said, my name is Erin Johnson. I'm an independent consultant, um, but I, I spent about 13 years as an executive director of a community-based creative youth development organization in Cambridge called the Community Arts Center. Um, I've been working in the nonprofit sector for a long time because I'm old now. So probably, I don't know, 25 years or so um, in different roles, all in arts organizations, primarily in youth organizations. Um, and we, you know, Anita and I had the opportunity through our work together to, to be part of this initiative with MCC um, and really put some thought into, um, particularly for this working from home, but in general, how to have a healthy relationship to work. And I'll say um, both of our experience as leadership leaders in the field and workers in the field, the, the arts and culture field, field and nonprofit is I, what I feel like we're coming from that place of deep experience there, deep empathy and care for you all as workers um, and you know our shared values that we bring together and really trying to figure out how do we do this work better in ways that are good for the work we're doing but also maintain our own health, especially during tight these times of crisis. So it's really exciting to be able to think together with you all about that. And I'll let Anita introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to uh, talk a bit about creating kind of a healthy work from home experience. Um, like Aaron said, I'm also um, a nonprofit leader and urban planner by trade um, and continue to consult with arts and cultural organizations currently and was very excited um, about the opportunity to contribute to the field in this way. I think that, you know, MCC taking the time, energy, funds, um, effort to bring us together in a time when we really need support um, is so important. Um, and Erin and I have talked about this a lot and she is, I'm surprised that she didn't say something about this just now, but really thinking about how we all come to the table with a lot of expertise um, and thinking about not only how we do our work, but how we navigate this world um, and supporting, um, you know, the youth or the creatives or the municipality or, you know, the organization that we're currently working with and supporting. And so I thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks. 
Um, so really quickly, tech reviews. So we are, this actually the session will be recorded. So I apologize for that, it's a typo. Um, as Michael said, um, closed captioning is going to be provided. Um, we are gonna ask um, for you all to interact with us throughout the session, either by um, unmuting yourself and, and sharing some of your experiences or um, participating through the chat. So we really encourage you to, to, to do that. Um, if you have any, any questions about the tech, tech you can always uh, Michael's here to support us and Cheyenne, which we're so glad to have both of them here. Um, and we're going to make the slides available to you after the session. If there's any links or information that you need from the slides, um, they, they will be yours also. Um, so these this, this session is part of two sessions where we're going to cover these four things. So really talking about space, furniture needs, space options, how to make your workspace more functional, which we're, that's something we're going to focus a little bit more on today. Um, and then the other two goals are really around, um, around your experience within your space. So establishing and maintaining a routine, creating boundaries, maintaining balance, um, really how to make your work from home time healthier. Um, and so those are our four goals overall for the two, the two sessions, which our first session is today and the next one is two weeks from now. So not this coming week, but the following. We wanted to make sure that you all knew that um, the Arts and Business Council is offering uh, two sessions through MCC through the same initiative that are um, both on, I'm sorry, this is our second session right here on the 29th. And they're offering one that's about the legal considerations of having a remote workforce. Um, so it's sort of a, a different angle of, 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 uh, around working from home. Um, and that one's on May 6th. And I think we're gonna drop the link into the chat also so you guys can check that out. Um, but they're going to be offering some really important um, material there. So we encourage you to come to that. And obviously, we want you to come to our second session on the 29th. Um, so today, um, we are um, doing welcome. We're going to do a little a really quick icebreaker. Um, and we're going to talk a bit more about space today. Um, and then really go a little bit more deeper into different types of healthy practices to improve your work from home experience. Um, next week, we'll focus more on ideas around scheduling and different kind of technology tools um, to support community um, communication, et cetera, um, while you're working from home. Um, so very quickly, our agreements, and these are agreements that we bring across all of our workshops that we do through, through EA. Um, we really encourage you to make space and take space. So, um, to, to engage with the material by, by speaking with us um, and also to you know, give other people the opportunity to talk. Um, you know, this is a, a bit of a lighter topic than some of the other things we've been covering, but, but who knows what could come up when we talk about space. Um, so make sure that we keep things confidential, um, be open to new material, um, assume best intentions and be accountable for your impact on other folks. Um, so listen from the inside out, value the process. Um, and then self-care and community care, uh, make sure that you pay attention to your own needs, um, pay attention to other people in the room. Um, and then our values as EA, our um, racial and social justice is really central to our work. It's something that we bring to everything that we do as, as uh, a central theme. Um, community voice is also very important to us. Um, both Anita and I come from community-based organi or, uh, organizations, uh, background in community organizing, and really thinking about how to bring um, all the voices to the table. Um, and then the final thing, which, you know, it's gonna, you're, you'll hear as a theme over and over is that we, you know, we're coming to this with a lot of learned experience um, about working from home, about how to do this work in general. Um, but we also know that you all have a lot of experiences that are really valuable to share. Um, and, and that you'll, you'll learn from each other. So we really encourage you to, to, um, to, to contribute to the conversation. Um, so that's, so we're gonna do a little quick, a quick icebreaker. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment when we do this. The very first thing before we get to the icebreaker though, if you wouldn't mind renaming yourself, um, putting your name, your organization and your pronouns. And I just realized I haven't done yet that yet. So I'll do that too. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing and do the icebreaker so we can see each other while we do it because it's kind of fun that way. 
Um, so people don't mind if you can coming on camera, that would be great. Um, after you rename yourselves, give everyone a chance to do that. I didn't do it. Let me see. All right, so um, we are gonna do a, a quick icebreaker called Find Three Things. Um, hopefully you guys have all played this one because I think it's like one of the most fun Zoom icebreakers personally, um, but it's obviously relevant to this because it's about finding three things in your space, which is part of what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so you have two minutes, but if I feel like everybody's back, I'm just gonna shorten the time just for fun to make it more fun um, to find three things in your space. Um, you're gonna find one thing that's alive, one thing that's cozy and one thing that brings you joy. Okay, so that's three things, something alive, something cozy and something that brings you joy. And you have two minutes or less to do that. And we're gonna bring them all back and hopefully um, we'll get a, a few people to share what they found. So go, alive, cozy and something that brings you joy, go. All right, I have my three things. I guess everybody turned their cameras off to go get their three things because I guess they didn't want to look silly running around their space, but you know, I, I, I didn't mind. I just let myself look silly running around my space. All right, let's see, we have Emily coming on. There's Emily, hi Emily, here's Rachel. All right, we have almost everybody. So um, let's do, we're gonna show all of our things at the same time. And then I'm gonna um, ask you all to share or maybe one or two people to share one of their things. Probably just one or two people is all we have time for. for. I'm getting the, the look from Anita. I always love this game, but all right. Let's start with um, your, uh, your thing that's cozy, your cozy thing. Here we go. I brought this pillow. It's not that cozy, but it's cool. All right, and then your thing that's alive. You got a plant. Oh, you got two plants. A lot of plants. Sometimes you get people's cats and children. Oh, there's a cat. <laughs> Elizabeth brought herself. She's alive. <laughs> Very my cat good. and rabbit are in my house. <laughs> oh, there we go. But I you're know, alive in the office. <laughs> awesome. I played this once, and somebody made their sister come over. So. <laughs> So many options. And then finally, the thing that brings you joy. Very good. Oh, I got some Cape Cod potato chip pizza. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> awesome. Um, is there anybody who would be willing to share why, one of their things? Iced coffee from Emily. Awesome. Anybody who wanna, wants to talk about? Rachel, will you talk about one of the things you shared? Yeah, my thing that makes me happy are that they've had better days. That's about two weeks old now, but I'm actually very new to this role at Design Museum. I'm starting week three, or I guess I'm nearly ending week three. And these are some flowers that my one and a half year old goddaughter sent me on my first day of work saying she was so proud of me, obviously Aww. written by her mom, but it still <laughs> made me very happy. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else want to share one of the things they brought? Trina? Oh, hi. Is that Diane? I think that's Diane. Sorry, guys. Did you want to share something? Oh, no, she didn't. <laughs> Anyone I else? Want to yeah, um, Emily. So this is a purple blanket. Um, my grandma actually crocheted this for me for Christmas a couple years ago. And um, my office is freezing. So <laughs> I brought it to work because I don't trust my cat to not scratch it up. So I was like, mm -hmm. I can still use it and, you know, keep it safe. <laughs> awesome. Great. Anyone else burning to share? You don't have to, but I just don't want to let somebody who wants to share not be able to. 
<laughs> Anita wants to go. Um, <laughs> this is a good pass because so, I'm passing up to you anyway. <laughs> so this is an elephant, and um, it really makes me happy. My mom, um, she like loves. She doesn't like animals, right? But she loves. She's obsessed with elephants. So um, I have a few elephants in my home, and I'm also a jumbo. But that's usually what I think about is my mom when I see the elephants first. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So I'm going to turn it back over to Anita, who's going to transition us into our next activity. And I will start sharing the presentation again. Okay. Um, I do have to let you all know that I'm getting used to some new tech. Um, so that's one of the reasons why there's two of me. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm on my phone and on my computer, and I will stop sharing my video now and just focus on the slides. Uh, so bear with me just a moment. Okay. Um, so thank you all. Um, so, you know, space is uh, a really big deal. Um, I think particularly for those of us who, um, you know, find a lot of kind of, um, uh, validation in the routine of going into the office place um, and and are really excited to see our coworkers, both the ones that we really, really like and the ones that we, you know, it's on the edge. Um, because in those spaces, you're often, you know, learning and engaging in different ways. You are um, pushing um, folks beyond their capacity. I know in my, my work environment, um, even though it's virtual, I think Erin and I both kind of push each other to think about things in different ways. And sometimes, you know, it feels like it's kind of challenging to do that um, when you are so far away from each other. And so we were really excited to think about, you know, how your space uh, can be utilized to create kind of a really healthy um, uh, work from home experience and, can, and, you know, find ways that you can continue to, even in the midst of all of these challenges, contribute um, in a way that makes you feel full. Um, so if you can just go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so I'd like you all to put in the chat using one or two words, please describe your current work from home experience. And I'm gonna give you about maybe 30 seconds to do that. Okay, we have luxurious, distracting. Um, uncomfortable, small, hard to focus, terrible, lots of naps, super distracted, always tired, cramped, I hear you, <laughs> no commute. Um, the no commute piece is really interesting, right? Because even though, you know, MBTA used to be the bane of our existence for some of us, right? Um, I think there was a period where we really craved kind of that, you know, the, the interaction, the routine of going to the subway, picking up your coffee, going to your favorite coffee shop, even just walking by a familiar elder in your community as you're getting, you know, on your way for the day. Um, chaotic. Um, can, I'm sorry, if I can put a couple people on the spot, can anyone um, say a little bit more about the chaotic piece? Yes, that was mine. Um, I don't have a space where I can be separate from um, my animals and they are very active until, my rabbit is particularly active until like 1 2 p.m which is the bulk of my work day and yeah it's just you know I'm in I'm in my bedroom she's in her little pen and she's doing everything she can to get my attention chewing making sounds running around moving things rearranging and so I'm constantly getting up trying to get her satisfied trying to refocus just praying until I hit two o'clock and she takes her nap so it kind of feels like having a small child. Yeah, I hear you. I actually have 
how many animals do I have? I have three animals currently. <laughs> you get your loss <laughs> of how many. Um, I totally hear you, Elizabeth. Um, is there anyone else who wants to add some commentary to their one or two words? I just don't have like the discipline to be so completely like self-directed when I'm at my house. Yep. Like when I'm at work, if I'm on YouTube for three hours in a row, my boss is eventually going to walk behind me and I might get in trouble versus no one is watching me when I'm at my house that mm -hmm. has a very comfortable bed and a cat. Right. <laughs> Also very comfortable bed over here and a cat. Um, so I totally hear you, Emily. Um, so even in the midst of all of this, right? So I, I think I too um, have had some ups and downs, right? Um, I'm very fortunate to have at least one room that has a lot of light. Um, for some reason, that's not the room I picked as my office space at the beginning of COVID. <laughs> so I was operating in a, in a less than um, stellar environment. But it's really in thinking about kind of um, being honest with yourself about what you do have, um, what options are are there for you, and the ways to make it function the best that you can, so that you can continue to have a healthy experience. Um, <clears throat> So I'm just going to go into a little bit. Um, so I would suspect that working from home um, was a, a major culture shock and very overwhelming at first for many of us, not all of us, but many of us. And not only are we adjusting the ways that we think about work, but we're also uh, adjusting the ways that we actually do the work, um, what supports that work and who's around us to support us. Um, some of us thrive on the social aspects of traditional office space. So needless to say, we all have some adjustments to make. Um, and then we layer on that, of course, the stress, the fear, anxiety, and a gazillion other emotions that are associated with not only a global pandemic, but the continuous assaults on black and brown bodies that we've been witnessing over the past year um, and before that. So, you know, there's a lot to factor in. Um, over the past 12 months, um, working from home has had both positive and negative impacts for many. Um, some of us have more flexibility and are able to just, you know, fall into the groove. Um, others of us, um, like myself and Emily, you know, we have a really nice bed um, and <laughs> a, really, a really cozy cat that's willing to snuggle at any moment. And so it's really about finding that rhythm. We're going to talk a little bit about some routines that can help normalize that. Um, although some of us have the option of a hybrid work scenario currently, many of us will continue to spend the majority of our days in our in-home workspaces. Um, and so we are going to dissect some of those components. Um, so let's see. Um, next slide. So interspersed in this presentation, you're going to see these really great editorial looking workspaces, right? And I put those in there intentionally. Um, that's not our, that's not usually our spaces, right? I mean, you know, sometimes we'll have some really great lighting. Sometimes we'll have amazing plants um, that will help to impact air quality. And other times we won't, um, but it's really about kind of making the best of what you have, um, really identifying what resources you have to contribute to that space. Um, also thinking about what resources your employers can play can can um, add to play in getting the workspace up to par so that it functions properly um, are all considerations. Next slide, please. This is another one of those lovely spaces. Next slide. So I have another question. So what percentage of the work week are you currently working from home? If you all can add that to the chat. Okay, so the majority of us, um, it's only a few people, one person who's not working 100% from home. Okay, next slide. 
So in thinking about um, those of us who are spending the majority of time in our workspace um, at home, it's really in thinking about kind of what are, what are the um, tools, equipment that we need to make it the most functioning space to be able to get our work done. Um, for several, several of us, um, I know that we already have at home computers. Some of us had printers or were able to borrow printers from the office, but with a work environment, um, as Michael mentioned at the beginning, that is more likely than not uh, will continue to be at home um, or in some hybrid fashion, folks really um, need to start thinking about kind of longer term and how those spaces can function to be um, kind of optimal to get work done, right? So one of the examples that comes to mind from some of the things that I was reading was in thinking about even as simple as your office chair, right? So <clears throat> many of us have some makeshift temporary office space that was in our house before, or we have an amazing dining room table with a chair that was just the perfect thing at the beginning of the pandemic. However, in thinking about, you know, a year in, whether um, ergonomically, that chair will be suitable to take us into a second year of um, working from home, it's unlikely, right? And so it's time to think about kind of what is the most healthy dynamic to be able to be as productive as possible. One of the things that's suggested is to outline a list of items that you would need to be able to function. Simply thinking, not from a desire perspective, but just a need perspective. What are the things that you've had in your traditional workspace in the office? What are the things that helped you to get through your day-to-day -day, uh, easier? What are the things that really made things a lot, um, you know, function in a way that you just, it wouldn't have happened unless you had. So for instance, the printer, the copier, the, um, the, the second monitor sometimes, depending on the type of work that you're doing. Um, I know that Aaron mentioned um, the session that's coming up on May 6th, um, even in thinking about who is in your household, right? The legal considerations on whether you need a screen protector. Um, Elizabeth, you talked a little bit about, you know, your bunny and the animals in your house and how, you know, they have needs and sometimes those needs are attached to sounds and, you know, so they're calling out to you in their own special way, right? And so a lot of us that also have either families or children, you know, as long as they're safe, um, we really need headphones, right? And that's something that I, I really didn't want to invest in in the beginning, but have found it to be kind of necessary for me to be able to ignore the dogs and the cat um, in the kind of the meatiest part of my day when they need me the most, I guess, or they're asking for me the most. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we're just going to move right. I just want to ask, is there uh, any questions so far? There's one comment in the, in the chat, printer, being able to write on handouts. I've never used sticky notes <laughs> as much in my whole life. I totally hear you. Um, I too have, um, you know, thought about kind of my tech investments in different ways, right? I'm somebody who really likes um, actual paper and actual pencils and pens. Um, and for the first time, you know, considered and purchased an iPad. And it was something that was totally outside of um, what was comfortable for me. Um, but it was really something that I feel like has enhanced my productivity in the work that I'm currently doing and how I'm supporting um, the various projects that I'm working on. And so, so sometimes it's about thinking about kind of not only what your, what your current needs are, but what is gonna make um, kind of the quality of your day uh, better, right? And often the cases, um, something that we'll talk about a little bit later, um, is really having the open and honest communication. Um, you know, you own you you definitely want to be able to check in with yourself. If something's not feeling right, if you you know there was a pattern that you were using in terms of getting you know productivity and getting work done um, before, and it's not working for you currently. 
you need to be honest with yourself about that. And another piece of that is communicating with your employer, right? Because some of these things are beyond, um, you know, what our, our, our modest budgets, nonprofit budgets can afford. And so really checking in with them to say, you know, uh, the screen is really bright. I need I need special glasses to make sure that this is this is comfortable for me. I'm noticing that when I get off the computer in the evening, that my eyes are you know it just doesn't seem the same. Um, so really being um, uh, mindful, um, checking in with yourself, and also communicating these these shifts in possible your in your possible needs with your employer. Um, to close out that thought, because sometimes I jump around, is that sometimes um, the nonprofit. Uh, maybe even the board will get together and have a certain fund that can then contribute to some of your additional tech needs in this time. So it's something to consider. So being open and honest and upfront about how that shifts is really important and key. Anita, can I ask you a question? Please. Uh, here. So as we're talking about uh, our workspace needs um, and a lot of the pictures as you say, our architectural digest kind of thing. We all know we don't have homes like that. And many times our workspace is not a separate room. It's the kitchen table or other places where it's hard to focus and you can't shut off the outside world from your personal reality, what's, whatever's going on. Do you have uh, tips or tricks that someone who can't devote dedicated space for work, how they can um, stay on task and be motivated and try to be as focused as possible. Definitely. Um, so a few of the things that we found um, were things, depending on where you live, right? Whether you rent or you own, um, is thinking about putting up an additional curtain Right. So it's not something that's, you know, will break the bank um, and it's easy to do. Sometimes you can do the expandable um, and put up a, you know, a curtain in, the, in a smaller space. Some people are even using closets as their office space because they can't really get away from, you know, uh, loud members of their family, et cetera. Um, something else that um, I've seen in other uh, friends' houses is the uh, retractable screens that folks are using. So that has also been a really nice um, uh, uh, option for folks. Um, so just thinking about how you can divide up the space. Sometimes you can still hear people, but I think it's nice to not be able to kind, kind of see what's going on. Um, and again, the headphones have been kind of a godsend um, for a lot of us. Um, so in thinking addition, you know, thank you that for that question, Michael, and thinking more about um, space needs. So if folks do not have a dedicated space, um, the first thing I would do once after you've created a list of the items that you definitely know that you need to have a productive workspace is identifying what you have currently in your home. Also, check in with your employer to see if there are ways that you can borrow some of those items from the office space. Sometimes they also have integrated budgets and support to make sure that some of those things can go to your home on a temporary basis. So for these additional items that you um, would like and would make it more suitable, you can create a budget. Um, I've had friends who have done kind of as small as $250 or $50, just depending on what they had available to them to make the space um, more suitable and pleasing for productivity. Um, also, something that was very um, kind of useful for me is uh, it was emptying out the small, really tiny space. So I had a back room um, that was less well lit than the room that I'm currently in. And it was helpful to move everything out of that space and then put back in what I thought was the appropriate kind of office items um, to help me function in that space. The next, the next piece is job specific considerations. And so this is also a piece that has overlap when thinking about legal considerations. Um, it's whether you need to have space for private meetings, um, whether you're handling any confidential information. For some of us, we have staff um, and we have to have certain conversations in regards to, you know, not every nonprofit has HR. So people are doing double duty in terms of, of those pieces. And so sometimes, you know, it, it would, 
be very unfortunate, right? The kind of ridiculous scenario is that your teenager is TikToking and you are <laughs> saying something confidential. Um, and so it, it's really important for us to at least try to have those options available to make sure that things are safe and those considerations are made. Um, often the cases, um, again, that someone will change, you know, a, a, a coat closet into a space that is, um, you know, kind of a temporary, so you can have that 15 minute conversation, you know, something really small as a, as a fold out table and a small chair, just so it can be a private, you know, quiet, uh, confidential space. So the, the next um, is understanding um, of what options are realistic in your household, right? I don't think that, you know, we've we've already gone through a period where we've had extreme stress um and and challenges around making the accommodations for um you know a global pandemic and so it really doesn't make sense for you to you know put an additional unnecessary and undue stress on yourself and thinking about things that just aren't possible in your household and it's really about finding what works the best for you sometimes it's a corner space. Sometimes it's a really small desk. Sometimes um, I know that at the beginning of COVID, again, really dark workspace, um, I was taking meetings on the porch um, and that and it really worked out for me. It was, you know, it was a nice opportunity to get some vitamin D, forcing myself to go outside. Um, and it's what I could do at the time. Um, I'm definitely not going to move out of this apartment anytime soon. And so um, it's really about kind of making this work the best that, that it possibly can. Um, addition, uh, uh, something else that has been really helpful for me, and then I want to actually just pass it off to Erin to hear about her, because I know that she also made some adjustments in terms of her workspace, right? She has, as you see behind her, she's currently in a really amazing um, room, and that that wasn't the case at first. She did, she was in another amazing room, but she has family, and there's a pet, and there's other things going on, but so for me, um, I know that I'm committed to this space, and I know what my limitations are. I also know what I need to feel healthy and supported in my environment. And so it was really about making those adjustments. Erin, if I can hear a little bit from you. Sure. Um, yeah, I would just say in terms of um, managing spaces where you don't, or I would say being able to be productive when you don't have a lot of options around space. Um, the key for me was really is really scheduling. Um, so I have two kids um, and a dog and we were all working and schooling from home at the same time. Um, so I actually created a schedule um, for who was using what workspace at what time. Um, and then I had certain spaces. Um, we all were able to have mobile laptops and, and we, have, we were kind of constantly doing the dance around each other um, so that we could have quiet spaces when we needed them. But um, we did and still do daily meetings at the beginning of each day so that we can work out those logistics. Um, it's hard if your kids are really young to do that, but I really encourage anybody who's managing um, kids or pets um, to sit down every day for five or 10 minutes and figure out how you're going to manage through your meetings and through your workload for that day, every day. Um, because in reality, a lot of the things that we're continuing to do, even a year later, um, it, it's still some certain logistics still feel new to manage. Um, I did, as Anita said, uh, um, sometime this past fall, um, create a room in my attic. Um, so I'm in my attic right now. Um, and we cover the walls with this beadboard. Um, so it's, it's pretty much a legitimate room. It took a lot, a lot of work, like every weekend for, uh, you know, about a month. Um, but I think as much as you can look for opportunities and we live in a small apartment, four of us, so there's really not a lot of space. Um, it did make a huge difference to have a place that I could go where I can shut the door um and and put a sign on the door and i think we'll we'll talk later more about boundaries but setting very clear boundaries is also really important um, to controlling the noise and activity around you when you have important um meetings so really constant communication with the other people who are using your space both ongoing and every single day about important things that might be coming up thank you for that sure. um is there any other comments from anyone else about what's currently happening in their space or any changes or shifts that they've had to make? 
Well, I can I could say something real quick uh, to get us going. I'm I'm glad, Aaron, that you talked briefly about boundaries, and we're going to be uh, talking about that a little more um, because I think that's a hard thing. Whether you have roommates or a spouse or a partner or children or whatever it is, sometimes you have to get your inner Brene Brown on <laughs> when it comes mm-hmm. to boundaries <laughs> and to say. And and I like your approach of having like meet very clear meetings at the beginning of a week to say this is what I have. This is a, what's really important to have certain spaces. And whether that's on a calendar or some kind of scheduling app or something like that. So folks know kind of what's going on within reason. Anything can happen during the week, of course, but that way you kind of do hold space for yourself and say, this is really important. So I have to do this. And so I was gonna ask you that question about boundaries. So I'll just, I'll just tune in <laughs> as we keep going. But I like that comment about the, the uh, scheduling. And we do actually daily meetings. So we do about 10 minutes every day, every morning at the top of it each day to talk about what each person has coming up. So um, we can all take that into consideration and actually also to check in how, we, how we're all doing emotionally. Um, because you'd be surprised if somebody's, if, if your teenager's having a bad day, so are you. <laughs> if we're all in the same space. So, um, and I have a teenager, I have a 14 year old. So, so really trying to be very aware of the emotional needs of the other people sharing space for you with you on a daily basis is really important. So, so I'm just going to check out the chat to see if there's any additional comments or... Nope. Okay. Um, So we'll actually just um, move into, um, we've actually finished up this section a little bit early. So we're going to move into a five minute break. um, And then we're going to return with a conversation on healthy practices. Um, So right now it is 315. So if we, if folks could be back at 320, that'll be great. Are we back? Welcome back, everyone. Okay, welcome back. Um, So let's just get right into our next slide. We're gonna talk a little bit about healthy practices. Um, I have a question for the group. Um, If you could unmute yourselves, um, I would love to hear a little bit about what ways you're maintaining health during this time. Um, Do you have any practices in place? are there things that you're doing now that you weren't before? Are there things that are supporting you more now um, because you're in a work from home environment? So what are what ways are you maintaining health during this time? I'll go. Um, I bought a little peddler bike thing that I found out is for the elderly, but it also works for me to keep myself moving even when I have to sit for long periods of time. Nice, nice. Uh, Okay, I'll just talk. Um, So uh, I live alone, so I don't have the the people interaction problem, but, um, but that also means that I can get isolated. So both for my mental health and my physical health, 
I set up walks with friends once or twice a week, distance, distanced and masked. Um, but that that really helps. And I absolutely notice it when I don't do that. Nice, thank you. Rachel. I'm really enjoying the extra space in the day that I'm not commuting for an hour on the morning and the evening. So being able to do yoga during my noon lunchtime break instead of from like 7.30 to 8.30 and then getting home super late. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. Anyone else? I can I'll jump. go. I'll go ahead. <laughs> I was I was just gonna say um, I've I've kind of got in my inner uh, visual artist, which is not one of my strong suits. I'm I'm a musician, and so I've been sketching and drawing and journaling and and having because we're so much on a computer and typing and all of that that I've been losing a tactile. Um, part of myself. So sketching out, that was actually one of the things that I showed earlier that brought joy was a little sketchbook that I got. And like, even now, like as you were talking, you needed today, I could have easily typed notes in a Word document, but just writing them down on paper is like a different mental uh, space for me. Uh, and it's something that I used to do a lot more. Um, and then now at home, I don't do. So I try to make space for that. That's really great. I, I get up um, early enough to be by myself in the house, which is important. The dog is up, so <laughs> so I have the dog, but, um, and I always read some work of fiction. Um, I, I tried to read some of my nonfiction stuff at that time, and um, I realized it just isn't what I need. I need something that's kind of going to bring me out of my, of my world. Um, I've been le reading a lot of science fiction um, and that actually is interesting. I like it, liked it before, but not, I'm really into it right now. And I think it's somehow this, I this idea of other worlds and other ideas, sort of the hopefulness that that brings um, has been really helpful. So I read for about half an hour and then I always, I, now I can safely say that I go running. I used to just walk and run when it pleases me. That's what I'd be like. <laughs> I just run when I want to, <laughs> but now I mostly run. And I don't do it like to try to be fit necessarily. I do it because I don't want to go, you know, to keep my mental health. And it, it really, I notice the difference every time when I don't go, like, like Diane was saying, then I just feel a little kind of off and all the entire day. So it's really helpful to start my day that way. Yeah. Um, if I can add, I, you know, I'm very fortunate. I live in Boston. I'm very fortunate to live across the street from a relatively small park and about um, a 10 minute walk from Franklin Park. And so the park spaces have been um, really kind of critical for me just to, you know, get out, get some fresh air. Sometimes it's with a friend, social distance, of course, but it's been amazing to have that. Anyone else? No, okay. Um, so next slide, please. Okay. Um, so, you know, pieces of what, um, in terms of creating uh, healthy patterns, right? And dealing with our new normal, um, a lot of what's been repeated, um, one slide back um, is, how you're starting your day. Um, one thing that's been repeated several times is treating the day as if you were actually leaving the house, right? And so getting up um, at the about the same time and uh, getting dressed and taking shower and doing all of the things that you need to do to prep for the day, but really having a solid routine in place um, because that really helps your mind kind of get in the groove that yes, you know, for the next few hours, I'm going to do this thing, um, you know, regardless of whether I'm doing it outside of the house or in the house. Um, also, something that's helped me quite a bit is having kind of a visible schedule of the workday. Um, and for me, it's some of the re repeated, repeated meetings that are happening throughout the week. Um, and also being mindful of, of overbooking, right? Um, I think at the beginning of COVID, I heard from um, a number of nonprofit leaders that, you know, it just, it, 
because of everything that was going on and the sense of, you know, immediate need that folks were just booking meeting after meeting after meeting. And because there was no commute time and all of this um, that, you know, then at the end of the, an eight hour workday, you still have the work to do, right? So just in, in terms of really balancing out and understanding that in between those meetings, you need a little bit of dead time and you need to be able to think and, and also process and, and do the work of those meetings, right? <clears throat> um, Another piece that has come out of some of the research was looking at kind of to do lists and how it is great to have, a, you know, a comprehensive list of all the things that you have to do, but in thinking about your day to day um, is identifying those top three or four things that need to get done in that day and having kind of like the secondary list of things that, you know, can be tended to that are attached to other things that are supported by others, but really having kind of those three or four top things that you um, are going to tackle that day. Another piece um, is the intentional breaks and at what I'm calling out of office time, right? So out of our, out of our traditional, out of our less than traditional home office time. Um, so having those 15, 20, maybe even 35 minute breaks, um, being able to get out, get some fresh air, maybe some sunlight for some that means walking around the block for others. That means, you know, taking some coffee on the porch, um, but making sure that you are able to turn that sign to out of office um, that virtual sign to out of office and really having some you time to recalibrate. Um, I know I mentioned it before and just thinking about how much, you know, pressure and, and strain we're putting on our eyes um, because we're, we're looking at this computer all day long um, and thinking about how you take breaks from the computer periodically and really knowing that that is a part of, of your kind of, you know, maintaining health for yourself and how important it is. Not only, you know, the glasses that you wear, or, you know, having the anti-reflective um, pieces, but also in just kind of not looking at the screen for periods of time. Um, another piece that um, came out of conversations with several leaders was in thinking about how you're clocking out, right? What does that look like? Um, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit from the folks today. Um, traditionally, like over the last three to six months, when have you been clocking out? Like what times, what does that look like, honestly? Anyone? 3 a.m. Yes, Emily, we must be related. Um, very similar, <laughs> very similar over here. Um, you know, it's when the vibe hits you and you're like, oh my God, I got to take care of this thing. Um, anyone else? Night owl, yes. Anyone else? Um, sometimes that you're clocking out. Uh, don't tell Michael Ibrahim, but I can be working till 2.30 in the afternoon and then my whole day is shot or I could be working till 8.30 in the evening and not know where my day went. Right, yes. And and that is by, I th you know, a lot of times, and please respond to this, but is that because you feel you've overscheduled your day? No, I think it is because I have underscheduled my day. Okay. I feel like the meetings get priority and then when it comes to just things I have to sit down and do by myself, either, and it's changed recently because we just put our toddler into daycare. So this was a bigger problem when she was home all day, but I felt like I put so much time and mental energy into the meetings that I had to be in that I did not put enough on the work I just had to sit down and get done. That makes sense. Anyone else? Well, I, I can add to that. Um, it, it's so variable and that's the problem is that one day it could be normal time and then you get an email at nine at night and you say, well, let me just do that because it's something that I'm gonna have to deal with tomorrow and I just don't wanna be thinking about it all the time. So it's it's hard to shut things off and keep the schedule, at least in my opinion. Um, and when you're in the same physical space as where you are 
privately or personally as where you are professionally. It's hard, it's a very uh, blurry line. Um, and sometimes it can be very hard to, to turn that off completely. And I know that I have gotten to the point that I've removed my work email from my phone completely yes. and my iPad and where else I get it. Um, and I use the same computer, which might not also be the great thing because our work computer is not great. So I use my Mac and I've set up different accounts, like different screens. So like, I don't even see my work email come in on my personal side of the computer. Um, just because if, if I'm working or doing other things privately or, or for other things, and I see an email come in, I will respond to it just because it's right in front of me. And I have personally have a hard time with that barrier. So mm -hmm. because is what you were saying with the routine, I have a hard time with that. And so it starts to seep in to other things. Yeah. Also, too, for me is that the being in the house all the time, we're just generating a lot of dishes um, <laughs> that are dirty and generate it's the, the usage of the house and then what it takes to maintain the house in a normal state um, is um, it just requires a lot more time. And so I'm working so much during the day that um, or I, my work is so interrupted during the day that once I if I want un uninterrupted time, I have to wait until um, somebody else is home until my husband's home and then I can work uninterrupted. So I'm working at night, which I don't, you know, until like eight or eight 30 or nine. Um, so that, that, but the, the dishes and all the stuff, and I have a hard time being productive if I have a lot of like visual mess around me. So it's hard to manage all of that, all of those things at the same time and the time it takes to do those things. And I think this is one thing that we didn't bring up before, and Aaron, you bring up a really great point, is about folks that are playing multiple roles um, throughout the day and really, you know, knowing that you're not just working your nine to five, you're also tending to your family and, you know, you're, um, you're prepping meals. Like, you know, a lot of people are talking, have been talking about, particularly the ones who have teenagers, like, oh my God, there's so much food. Like, when did, how did, <laughs> we didn't know that these little people ate so much throughout the day, but. Um, really thinking about kind of also going back to that schedule and, and really using it kind of as a checkpoint to balance um, the multiple roles that you're playing and to know that, you know, sometimes it's going to be really challenging and um, sometimes you're not going to get to everything, but really showing yourself grace during this period and, um, and knowing that, you know, it really helps to know that your organization is supportive of that and that you are trying your best. Um, so that's one thing to think about is that the fact that a lot of us are, are um, have multiple roles. Um, next slide, please. Um, so another piece of finding balance. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the second session, but checking in with coworkers. Um, I talked to Aaron a lot about this kind of my theory around the virtual water cooler, right? And so sometimes you're going to get a random call from me. You're gonna, you know, I'm peeking my head in the, I'm peeking my head in the office, so to speak. Hey, how are you doing? Um, do you have a minute to chat, kind of thing? So that's what we would do if we were in a traditional space. And so I make every effort to not to, to not hold back those pieces. I think that particularly if you have a group of coworkers that you, you've worked with for you know, some time, sometimes several years, um, to really talk to each other and you know, be open to creating the virtual spaces that you had in person. And so, you know, sometimes that means being able to randomly send a text message or give a random call that's, you know, the equivalent of a peeking in to the office. Um, sometimes, you know, saying, oh, do you have time to meet at the water cooler in 10 or 15 minutes? So you can have a 10 minute conversation. Um, one of the things that I was reading during this time and preparing for this session was around, um, the hits around creativity and innovation, right? We aren't able to, um, you know, if you're all in a meeting together in the same space to interrupt each other and to, you know, say, no, we, this project has to happen or it has to happen this way. And so really being able to think outside of the box about the ways that we're communicating with each other and able to push each other um, in positive ways. The next thing um, is having your camera on during during the virtual meeting. So like, you know, if you're in um, your weekly uh, team meeting, it's really nice to be able to see folks 
uh, responses, um, the rolling of eyes or the smile um, or the nodding of the head for reassurance. Um, what I've found in these settings is it's really hard to gauge people's emotion and buy-in. Um, and if you're working in a team setting, it's something that, you know, it's, it's critical to our work, particularly in smaller, in smaller organizations, um, you know, and definitely in smaller arts and cultural organizations where a lot of what we do, again, relies on that creativity and that connectivity of each other. Um, so having your camera on, I know sometimes it's hard, depending on, you know, what you're going through during the day and, you know, not everyone wants to do that all day long, but as much as possible being able to, you know, uh, let folks know where you are um, around the conversation that's being had. And then um, the last one for this slide is kind of thinking about the, the intentional breaks and the out of office time again, and just really knowing that when you schedule this time, it's really for you and not to infringe on that. Um, you know, I have been in four hour meetings. I've been in six hour meetings. I've been in eight hour Zoom me meetings um, with like a 30 minute break. So things that are really seem a little bit ridiculous. Um, and, you know, the things that I've been able to do myself is to um, set boundaries and limits for myself and knowing that, oh, you know, I need, I need at least 45 minutes. I need to be able to eat. I want to stand. I want to do <laughs> these kinds of things that it's going to help me be more present um, and prepared to interact and engage in a setting for this long of a period. Um, also, uh, you know, when the meetings are that long, um, I find myself breaking it up when I'm standing and when I'm sitting, right? I think if it, it's a portion of, this is just something that I use, if it's a portion of the meeting where it calls on me to be very engaged and interactive, even to the point where, you know, I'm, if I'm not leading a portion, then I'm kind of one of the key stakeholders in this meeting, then I like to stand up, right? Because I want, I, I, it just, it feels like it's a different setting, even though it's not. Um, and then for other pieces of meetings um, or, or other types of meetings, I will sit down during the meeting, not less engaged, but it just somehow breaks it up for me. Um, uh, what tools are you all using to balance your meetings throughout the day? Are there little things that you're doing to stay kind of awake, alert, um, engaged? Um, I think there's a few things in the chat. I've planned eight hour Zoom days. They're terrible on every side. I agree. <laughs> um, are there things that folks are doing that are different um, in terms of the breaks or how you show up in meetings? Are there any tips or tricks um, or things that have been working for you? It will be great to hear from you guys. Anyone? Um, so kind of speaking about the virtual water cooler time, um, Something that we actually, some of us just recently started naming is just having a like scheduled Zoom where we do work together. And it's just like having somebody else on the screen. And a couple colleagues had called it co-working. And I was like, wait, that's that's the only reason I survived like March 2020 is, mm -hmm. you know, calling my my colleague. Like we would spend the whole working day just with each other in the back because that mimics our relationship in the office um, that, you know, we sit across from each other and work with each other and just having that, it was such an anchor. And I think, thankfully, like, you know, with, with, you know, our hybrid schedule now, of course, that's not always possible, but um, on our remote days, which are both Fridays, it's still something we'll just kind of just do. <laughs> and it just, it just happens. Um, so I think maybe being more intentional with that has been really great for a lot of the newer members on our team who've joined uh, like completely remotely um, and have just started to just started to feel comfortable with like office culture and things like that have expressed really liking having those co-working sessions where they can just know they feel um, like they're working with people instead of just by themselves and just have a little bit of that you know office mimicking time <laughs> as mm -hmm. we see each other on the screen. Thank you for that. Um... I have found um, there's actually on YouTube, right? 
there are these videos that range anywhere from two to six to 10 hours of folks doing work. Um, you can hear their background. You can hear them typing. Um, I've actually found this very relaxing um, and really helped me get through portions of the day because it just mimicked the sounds um, of an office space. And so um, I will try to, I will put one or two of those in the chat for you all. Um, those have been really helpful. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so one more question, um, how are you checking in with yourself and others? So, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that it's really critical for us to think about kind of knowing what our needs are and when those needs shift. Um, are there certain ways that you, um, have like a gauge of when things are changing for you? Are there ways that you're checking in with yourself? Are there ways that you're checking in with your coworkers um, and or your employer? Um, for some of us, it may be with, you know, the board. Um, are folks checking in? So I work on a team with three people. And um, Ever since this began, we started with a, a check-in at 9.15 every morning, and we talk through issues and figure out what um, each one is doing during the day. And it's also a personal check-in. So um, it's been it's been it's been really important. It's been one of those foundational things that made it easier to keep going and to be productive and to feel connected. Nice. Um, other folks? I'm still pretty new to this role, but I've appreciated that they have a structured weekly meeting sequence where so before the pandemic, Mondays were work from home Mondays and they found that the magic of that disappeared. So now Mondays are no meeting Mondays. <laughs> and then Tuesday at 9 a.m. is a check-in where everyone talks about the week ahead. And then Friday at 11 a.m. is a reflection back on the week and what they're anticipating in the week ahead. And then every other Friday, there's a 4 p.m. happy hour where folks aren't necessarily drinking but it's just a chance to decompress and connect and tell funny stories outside of the work sphere. And that is certainly not the same as being together around the water cooler, but has made a big difference. Nice. Um, anyone else? Okay, well, let's move on to the next slide. So this is just acknowledges, like checking in with yourself is important, um, acknowledging when your needs have changed and communicating with your supervisor or board. Um, you know, I, I selected this image because for some of us, I know for me, sometimes I can feel shifts in my body. And so my body will tell me before my mind tells me that, you know, something needs to be addressed. Um, and so just really being mindful of that and knowing that, you know, this is, this is also very important. Like you, you are your primary, you know, responsibility, which you all know. And um, without you, um, you know, the world is very different. So please, you know, be mindful of checking in with yourself um, and also the people who are supporting you, your coworkers, um, your employer, the board. Um, so now I'm going to pass it off to Aaron for our next part. Um, I'm also gonna put some of those references in the chat um, with the YouTube sessions, thank you. Um, so for our last section, um, we wanted to introduce you all to a model that Anita and I have been working on together um, that really we've used in all three of the sessions we've run for Mass Cultural Council. Um, and, and it's around different types of self-care. Um, and we have found that it's really has been relevant to leadership, which is our first section. Um, our, our, our most recent session was just about sort of the day to day mental health needs that we might have in, in our in our lives and in our work and and around work from home. It all seems to apply. 
Um, so I want to introduce you to the model and then really talk about how each of these, each of these types of self-care um, can be uh, applied to your work from home life and really to improving how it feels to work from home, your productivity, um, et cetera. And really the idea here is um, so many of, of the ideas that Anita um, introduced that you all have been sharing um, fit within one of these, one of these types of self-care. And so what we really are encouraging you to do is to think about as we talk through all of this, um, where, what, where, where are the places that you are caring for yourself? Which of these types of self-care really resonate for you? Um, and then where are places that you might be able to concentrate more? Um, because I, I know for me, this resonated a lot um, in, in that thinking about a balance between these four areas made a lot of sense to me and looking back at my professional life in the nonprofit sector. Um, so in this um, model, the idea is that there are four types of self-care. This was um, adapted from um, uh, so, uh, an article by Deanna Zant, and um, she, this, the particular model is something that we put together and we changed some of the language, but these four types come from her. Um, and so the, the first two is the idea of self-soothing and self-care. And I honestly had never seen it separated out in this, in this way. Um, and we really discovered her four types were really divided into two areas. One is your individual internal work. And one is this work that you're doing that is a way of caring for yourself that is connected to the external world or to the community. Um, and, and what also was really resonant is the idea that there's a difference between self-soothing and self-care. So there are things that we do um, that are, are that, that we call self-soothing that we need to do in, a, in response to an immediate emergency, a, a high level of stress that we're feeling. Um, and there's some work around burnout um, that, that by the Nagoski sisters that talks about the idea that if, if you do not signal to your body physiologically that the stress moment is over, um, that, that you will continue to feel the stress even though the stressor itself has been removed. Um, so we, you can think of the, we call these things self-soothing, they're, they're immediate responses. And in terms of working for home, we're encouraging you to have a series of a sort of a self-soothing toolkit so that when really stressful things happen throughout the day that you take a break and you take that moment to get yourself grounded and, and, and feel good and be able to return to work and return to yourself really. Self-care on the other hand is about practices. So we talked a lot about scheduling um, and all of the things that you schedule into your day, whether it's your exercise in the morning or your yoga in the middle of the day, ways that you are practices that you're putting into your everyday life that are maintaining your self-care over time. And this is all work. Again, this is your individual internal work. On the flip side, there's this community external work. Um, one is community care, which it, you know, we already talked about a lot of those, the, the virtual water coolers, um, the check-ins Diane was talking about, that's, that is a, a, a type of community care. And there's actually research out there that says that that those interactions um, create a sense of well-being in people, that there is an actual, again, physiological response to being in community with others. So those are your, it, and you build a center, sense of interdependence where you are giving and you are getting back and, and it, it has that cyclical sense. So you need to be working those opportunities into your everyday life too. Um, and that both goes with your to your social life, ways that your social life might interact with your professional life, um, and, and also just ways that you're using your work to build community on behalf and for your organization and the people that your organization works with. Um, and the last one is structural care, which was the one when, when we first learned about these four terms that, that was the most surprising to me. Um, and Zant talks more about this as the idea of um, not there are structures that exist that work against our ability to um, to to have to be able to care for ourselves, right? Um, and so that's all connected to to structural oppression, structural racism, um, other kinds of ways that structures don't don't support our ability to to care for ourselves. Um, there's a lot of great work that's also done has been done. Shanjin Wright in particular writes about this how, that 
the act of um, working in community and doing activism is a type of self-care that that brings empowerment to people and that brings a sense of agency um, and, and interestingly, this was something that I wrote, I have written a lot about for grants and I had never thought a lot about how, what an important role that played for me as a leader over time, um, in, in terms of maintaining my, my leadership over time. I think what I discovered for myself though, is that although I was spending a lot of time on this kind of like lower left side, um, really doing a lot of what felt to me very vital and important activism um, and being in community a lot. I wasn't spending enough time, A, building my arsenal of self-soothing um, techniques. And so I had a constant feel of urgency that wasn't always positive for the work. I did great work, I'd still do, but um, it was something I'm really working to check myself on. And then the practices. And, and as Anita already talked about, this idea of bringing grace to our work um, is a lot about this. It's recognizing that we are both, we are in this time of an acknowledgement of historical trauma um, and also a time of a new trauma of a pandemic. Um, so, so we really encourage you as you're thinking about how you're working at home to think about how you're balancing these four things. Um, and, and these are just some examples um, and I'm gonna read through them and I would love to just have you guys think in the chat. So self-soothing, these are some ways of where are we seeing, how can we think about self-soothing within our workday? So really the key with self-soothing is that you do need to step away from the computer and take a break. Um, and we had a great workshop with Sharman Jackman who um, has a business called InnoPsych um, that you all should check out. It particularly connects people with therapists of color. Um, and she um, talked to us about key ways to take a break. So a lot of those are included here. Um, and then also some additional ones that we added in that we pulled from other sources. Um, whatever works for you, it's important that you sit down and make your own list. And you can think right now, what are some things that you do that you know are gonna tell your body and tell yourself that the danger is over? Um, that, that things are okay. And these, you know, you go outside, you have a snack, you practice meditation and breathing, stretch, drink water. Um, keeping a bottle of water by your, by your desk is really important. Extend a kindness gesture, which I relayed this one that we got from Dr. Jackman. And I love this one. So taking a moment and sending a text to reach out to a friend, and that can be a two minute gesture but the ways that that kind of reminds you that the world exists outside of your screen and outside of the stressful moment you might be in at work is really, really important. Um, and then I'm not gonna go through each one of these by individually because I'm realizing we're running out of time, but I wanna draw your attention to this slide, which is just some resources around mindfulness. Um, in general, mindfulness techniques are, are, th are, are, are things we can use for self-soothing. Um, and these are two really great resources to go to for that. Um, and then self-care, you know, you're gonna get these slides so you can read these over. And we've been over a lot of these. So scheduling your day is a type of self-care. Um, and, and it is hard, I think to Emily's point, to have the discipline to make yourself sit and do it. But if you think about it as a way to maintain your own, your own mental health, like your sense of self, I think it brings the urgency up to really push yourself to do it relationships, saying yes and no when you mean it, kind of keeping boundaries, um, all of that are really, really important. Um, and then just all of the pieces around space um, and the ways you schedule and like healthy breakfast, exercise, all of that, um, space is a way of, of maintaining your own well-being. So these are all really important practices, right? Structures you put in place that are going to be there in your life so that you, you are having a certain baseline of care. And then we got into all these great, and these are just some other, these great ideas for community care that you guys are doing through work. Some other things to think about are ideas around mutual aid. So child care cooperatives, buy nothing groups. These are all things, especially as we start to go back into work or do these hybrid models to, to be thinking about. Um, and thinking about how having partnerships with other organizations, facilitating community meetings, you're having your own family meetings. These are types of community care when we are in community with our colleagues and trainings right now. This is a type of, of community care we are we're giving to you and you're giving back to us and we're giving to each other. Um, and then finally, the structural care. The two that we wanted to flag here is really, and there are many, many others, but the ways that you can 
it, when you're working towards these things in your work, um, it also is, it's a way to provide more care to you. The act of doing activism is, is a type of self-care and it will obviously and hopefully provide more opportunities for individualized self-care for, for yourself and others. Um, really thinking about build, building fair and just organizational policies and practices around living wage, comprehensive self-care, paid family leave, reasonable workload expectations, um, and creating and, and really advocating for that as leaders and as employees. And finally, to create programming that promotes um, promotes justice and equity and around the issues that we care about, the issues that are important to our communities and the assets that our communities have. Um, so we don't have a lot of time to go over all of these, but um, we're going to share these slides with you. And um, I we re again, we're going to, as we jump into next week, think more about scheduling and different kinds of scheduling tools and connecting tools. And we'll bring some of this back then um, so you can think about how you can balance these different types of self-care in your, in your work um, from home schedule. So I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Anita, before we wrap up. No, I think that's perfect. Um, so we're actually, um, would love to hear from you. We're not going to have you, we sometimes do this as an interactive slide where you can type in, um, but we're not doing it that, that way this time, but we would love to hear from you in the chat, um, something that you're, that you are taking away, um, anything that you would like to share, um, advice, either a piece of advice that you got or, um, Sorry, I'm trying to open up the chat and obviously failing. All I'm doing is pushing the slides forward. <laughs> Too many screens open at the same time. Any advice that you heard that you would like to apply um, from colleagues, self-care visual, text to friend when you know, there you go. Love the self-care visual again. Good, that's great. And we'll give the um, those this material to you guys so you can have that. Awesome. Um, 10 to 15 minute break, self-soothing to acknowledge when stress is over. Um, and that comes from a really great book by the by Emily and Amelia Nagoski about burnout. So I, I encourage you to check it out. And they also have some videos online, which are shorter. So you can <laughs> check out the videos and not have to read the whole book. Um, yeah, intentionality. Well, thank you guys so, so much. Um, as we mentioned before, um, just to, another quick reminder is that um, our next workshop, again, where we'll be talking more about community connections, giving you some tools around that, um, is on the 29th from 2.30 to 4. Um, we're excited to see you all there. And you can definitely encourage other, if you have any other colleagues that you think might want to come, you don't have to have come to this first one to come to that second one. And then um, the legal considerations of having a remote workforce, um, that one is going to be a really important kind of uh, companion workshop to this. Um, so we encourage you to check that one out. And thank you guys so much for your time and for taking these moments with us for the, the self, the community care that we all just participated in together. Um, and we will see you all in a few weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Anita. Thank you. Take care. Thank you all. So much. Bye. Bye. Bye.